Hi guys, it is a hot, sticky, wet bulb day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization up here on the uh, in the Finger Lakes of New York at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Looking at our third flash flood watch in seven days here on this sticky Saturday morning, July 17, 2021. So it is your lucky day, guys. You're going to get two closely related uh, chronicles of the, uh, the collapse. I just finished, you can find it uh, right next to this rat, from the BBC talking about how science failed to predict flood and heat intensity. But I decided to make this story on today's mainstream media from this outfit called Axios a separate uh, companion chronicle. Oh, this is by this fellow Andrew Friedman. I didn't realize Andrew had moved over to Axios. Andrew's a good guy. He's pro Andrew Friedman, in my opinion, is probably the best climate change journalist out there. Pretty much his whole career is explaining uh, climate change and these joke solutions to fixing it. Andrew Friedman is not an apocalyptimist. This uh, this man, you find him all over the place. I would like to talk to this man sometime, but he does a, a good a job of you know encapsulating uh, what's going on and explaining it, turning clueless morons into doomers. So this is Andrew Friedman making a futile attempt to turn a clueless moron into a doomer. Take it away, Andrew Friedman, who obviously uh, just finished reading Bright Green Lies by Derek Jensen. <clears throat> and this is his uh, essay this week. Climate solutions could cause their own problems. Hmm. What's this about, Andrew? You're kidding. World leaders are pondering unprecedented moves to combat global, warm, global warming by speeding up the transition to clean tech. Clean tech. But they're also learning more about the potential downsides of those changes. Wow. Why does this matter? The changes you know, these techno fixes, which I don't think Andrew buys into, but uh, these techno utopian fixes will be needed to avoid the most dire climate scenarios like we're seeing playing out already. But there are potential. There's nothing potential about them. I don't know why. I, I, my guess is Andrew Friedman did not put the word potential in this article, but some editor did. You know, covering his, his ass uh, editor. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to knock the word potential out of here. The changes will be needed to avoid the most dire climate scenarios, but there are, I will change it, serious environmental, human rights, and geopolitical risks to shifting how we get around, meaning our, our gas-sucking cars, the way our electric grid operates, and how everything from cement is made to buildings are constructed. <clears throat> what are they saying? This is, oh, so this is Andrew Friedman quoting Zeke Hausfather, Director of Climate and Energy at the Breakthrough Institute. Uh, Zeke and Andrew are good friends, I think. What is Zeke saying? Quote, It is important to recognize that decarbonizing our economy will not be small and beautiful, replacing all of our fossil fuel infrastructure with clean energy will be big and messy. Getting to net zero, and that's a whole nother uh, rant for another day, getting to net zero emissions by 2050 will require building a huge amount of new things incredibly quickly 
and will entail lots of conflicts with some traditional environmental prioritize. Close quote. So I'm going to break in here in my broken record rant what they are talking about is the carbon footprint versus the ecological footprint. This is the latest story uh, illustrating what nobody else except me and maybe Andy the gardener understands that the carbon footprint is one subset of the ecological footprint. So for, I think I had, did I have this rant yesterday? So every time you do something to try to reduce the carbon footprint part of the total ecological footprint, you do not make it disappear. You shift it from the carbon footprint most often to the habitat destruction and biodiversity collapse part of the ecological footprint. Every ounce of savings on the carbon footprint makes another part of the footprint uh, every bit as heavy and in my guess heavier. This, this, this is the, the, I haven't read Bright Green Lies. I don't even know if Derek Jensen explains this. I wish uh, Andrew Friedman would, would explain this, but I'm talking to myself blue in the face and maybe a few people listening to me understand what the big picture is. The big picture is we're screwed and there's too damn many humans on this planet eating too much stuff and all of this crap uh, it, it's a bunch of crap. We need to get humans off the planet. But anyway, back to Andrew Friedman, who actually likes to get published and paid for his work, unlike me. So what is Andrew Friedman? How does he describe the big picture? <clears throat> he just gives an example. All right, perhaps the best known problem, you know, about shifting the, the carbon footprint over, Perhaps the best known problem companies and countries are facing is how to source, meaning to dig up the word source. When you see, when you see the word source as a verb, it means dig up. The critical minerals needed for batteries that will be used to power electric cars, airplanes, energy storage devices, and more probably including this computer and the battery and this camera. <clears throat> Mining for these minerals on land, minerals including cobalt, lithium, manganese, and graphite can cause pollution, do you think so, and are often unsafe. In some places, like in China and the Congo, it can involve forced or child labor. Okay. Efforts are underway to consider how, now underway, how to mine the seabed for rare earth minerals, but here too, there is potential for environmental destruction, in this case, danger to sea life. <clears throat> the minerals are needed for electric vehicle batteries, but they're also in demand for other critical projects. These include the cons these include the construction. Are you listening here? The construction of vast arrays of wind turbines and solar photovoltaic farms. So Every windmill you see and every little solar panel farm, think about, a, you know, the gorilla blood uh, over there in the Congo, the slaves, think about the, the giant trawlers dragging the bottom of the ocean uh, so you can have a battery in, in your electric car. Uh, good Lord. Cleanly and ethically, producing batteries is far from the only challenge facing countries as they move to decarbonize their economies. 
other technologies, like every other technology out that, uh, every other alternative, every other alternative, uh, is the is the word other means every other. Uh, other technologies also threaten biodiversity by extracting resources and taking up large amounts of land, you know, land where our fellow earthlings live, including biomass energy with carbon capture and storage known as BECS. This involves extracting energy from biomass uh, such as certain crops grown for the purpose and capturing and storing the carbon. Okay, <clears throat> mining for critical minerals is also more energy intensive than mining for bulk materials, which means the mining process to get this crap for your clean energy, which means they could actually increase carbon emissions as demand grows. Thank you, Andrew Friedman. He's pretty much just encapsulating bright green lies is pretty much what he's doing. Okay, what next, Andrew? Right now, <clears throat> right now, we are hurtling toward an economy that will be far more dependent on a steady supply of all these materials, but they're not evenly distributed worldwide, presenting geopolitical challenges. For example, the vast majority of the world's supply of refined cobalt now comes from China, and China produces the most rare earth minerals overall. The U.S. is trying to mine more rare earth minerals domestically or secure additional supplies abroad. Okay, how it works. All right, this is the, this is the essential, uh, the, where he really gets to how this bullshit works. And anyone uh, wanting more information on this needs to listen to my interview. Look at my interview with uh, Professor Tim Garrett. You'll find it on here. Tim Garrett did a better job of explaining what Andrew Friedman is getting ready to say. But th this, is, this is how Andrew is telling clueless morons, turning them into doomers, how the world works. Okay. Since 2010, 11 years ago, the average amount of minerals needed for one new unit of power generation has increased by 50%. Every unit of energy being created now takes 50%, the planet takes 50% more of a hit than it did 11 years ago. Okay? Do you get it to what this means, people? No, you don't. People don't have any idea what this means. Okay, here's what it means is the uh, International Energy Agency found that a scenario in which our world reaches net zero carbon emissions by 2050, quote, would require six times, six times more mineral inputs in 2040 than today, close quote. This is exactly what uh, Tim Garrett was talking about, that, uh, well, you know, the way Tim Garrett explained this is uh, that in the next 20 to 30 years, to power uh, this global industrial economy of 8 billion people, just, just at our present rate, okay, what, what it means is over the next 20 to 30 years, humanity will eat as much of this planet as we have eaten since 17. 50, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution until today, that's 
between now and 2040 or 20 sometime in the next 30 years we are going to have to do that again and then in the next 20 years we're going to do it again and, and as Tim Garrett I mean he's a physicist said this is physically impossible it is not going to happen as Tim said something has got to give this sentence right here it is the end of the world as we know it. This is doomsday prophecy. It's right here in the damn IEA report. It's right here on the mainstream media. People talking about the mainstream media are a bunch of liars right here. Thank you. One more time. A scenario in which our world reaches net zero carbon emissions by 2050 would require six times more minerals, mineral inputs in the year 2040 than today. That's all you need to know to understand the end of the world. But, going on, what's next? What is next? The IEA warned that there needs to be, quote, broad and sustained efforts to improve the environmental and social performance of mineral supply chains. Oh yeah, the report also recommends more recycling programs and stronger environmental and human rights standards that help steer economic rewards to responsible suppliers. Okay. The bottom line, the decisions we make now to invest in new clean energy technologies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will dictate how much warming related disruption and damage we endure and any associated clean tech complications we will experience during the next several decades and the last uh, in, in the last uh, sentence where I kind of want to reach through here and slap Andrew Friedman but this is the bottom line according to 99% of, uh, of little lefty greenies this is why I am not a little lefty greenie I, I don't know why I, I guess it was the editors or and publishers of Axios who tagged this on to the end. The bottom line, ultimately, the concerns related to the energy transition pale in comparison to the far-reaching harms that would be caused by letting human-caused global warming to continue to escalate. And that perhaps is the single biggest bright green lie of them all. The biggest bright green whopper of them all. But uh, I don't have time to go. And if you don't understand, Book Hermit understands why that is the biggest bright green lie of them all. Book Hermit and Andy the Gardener and I can probably agree that that's the biggest whopper of them all. And here Andrew Friedman, or at least his editor, is, is guilty of spreading it. But I have to wrap up the second uh, chronicle of the collapse today because I have to get back to uh, helping... Uh, Kevin Shanholzer build Grand Coulee Dam to hold back the rising floodwaters before Sancho Panza and I go floating down the river tonight. And I suggest you get out there and start building Grand Coulee Dam while you still can. Bye guys.